let's get on the way. So welcome to our webinar on Fireside Chat, uh, discussing the key findings around the third uh, Australian Healthcare Index Report. Uh, it's the report that's been created by the Australian Patients Association. And, and for those who aren't familiar with the Australian Patients Association, it's an independent not-for-profit association dedicated to championing and protecting the rights and interests of patients, uh, particularly around advocacy and knowledge. Um, it's, uh, this report's also being uh, commissioned by uh, Health Engine, uh, which is the uh, largest consumer healthcare online platform helping around 4 million Australians every month to navigate the complex world of healthcare and connecting them with the right care and making their journeys more affordable, convenient and certain. Uh, my name is Marcus Tan. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Health Engine uh, and I'm actually the facilitator for today. And uh, I've got uh, joining me on our panel today, um, my uh, co-host, um, Stephen Mason, who's the CEO of uh, Australian Patients Association. Um, we have Leanne Durrington, who is the CEO of the WA Primary Health Alliance. Uh, we have Suzanne Greenwood, who's the Executive Director of the Pharmacy Guild of Australia. And uh, finally, uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Todd Cameron, who is the, who's a GP and founder of Scale My Clinic. So um, just as a matter of uh, just making sure that everybody is uh, aware of uh, the, the, the rules, I guess, um, we're actually joined by a whole bunch of people across the healthcare sector. Um, and uh, they're, they're gonna be people who are either in, involved in the healthcare sector in some way, shape or form, or actually very much interested in the care that, that, that uh, the healthcare sector is delivering. So there's probably a whole bunch of patients on the, on the uh, call as well. Um, and so for those of you who are online, uh, we are very keen to hear from you. So if you do have any questions uh, as we're talking, please feel free to put your questions inside the Q&A section and we'll endeavor to get to as many of those questions as we can uh, either as we go along or towards the end if we have time. So just a quick intro into the report um, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, basically it's a report that's been commissioned beginning in March of uh, 2021 uh, and uh, has been, uh, this is our third report, so it's been done every six months. And this particular report has been covering around about 11,000 plus Australians around the country uh, across all the different demographics uh, quite evenly. And it basically uh, can be accessed if you're interested at uh, australianhealthcareindex.com.au. Uh, and you can download it there. And there's also an interactive dashboard for those who are interested in state-specific or demographic-specific type of stats, uh, which is actually quite cool. So um, I guess just to give you a quick overview for those who haven't actually read the report uh, in full, um, there's some interesting top few concerns that have come out from the report. And the first, uh, the first one is just around private health insurance costs. Um, there's also obviously some concerns about emergency department wait times. And finally, there's uh, a, a, a quite a serious concern about access to mental health care. I think more broadly, if you're looking at themes uh, that comes out of the report, the clear theme to me is that consumers or patients are particularly concerned about the timely access to care. And um, that's largely due to limited availability or to an increase in cost. So just with that, I'd like to, um, uh, to maybe start off by uh, having Leanne come in um, to talk a little bit about mental health. And, uh, you know, for those of us who aren't all that familiar with WAFA and uh, the WA Primary Health Alliance and the Primary Health Networks, Leanne, are you happy to just quickly touch on what you do and, 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 and why you do it? <clears throat> um, well, hi, everybody. Uh, and uh, WAFA, or WA Primary Health Alliance, operates the three primary health networks in WA. So our footprint is the whole of WA. And uh, what we do is, you know, in its very simple uh, form is we provide support to general practice and then in and around general practice, we commission services that increase access to supports for people who might otherwise not attend or indeed present at an emergency department rather than a uh, community-based uh, service. And, and really our driver is both health equity and integration. So trying to build smooth out pathways for people to access care more readily. However, um, so, and we commission a range of mental health services and during the pandemic across Australia, uh, but predominantly in Victoria and in uh, New South Wales, to some degree Queensland, a whole range of new services were commissioned um, on behalf of the Commonwealth Government to provide mental health supports to people in those communities during those very long periods of lockdown. And, you know, without uh, talking to the research on this, clearly the lockdown periods and COVID and its implications uh, impacted what would normally be protective factors in people's lives that help them look after their mental health, whether that's playing footy with the mates on a Saturday 
or indeed catching up with dear friends. Um, you know, a whole range of implications came together. So whether or not people were managing themselves pretty well prior to the lockdowns, but with the loss of those protective factors, their mental health exacerbated, or indeed it was a direct correlation to the implications. So the, the, this uh, report, really interesting, I have to say, because it says 40% um, of that 11,000 or thereabouts, one of their major concerns was ease of access or timely access is how I would read it, to mental health support when they needed it. But then in the body of the report, um, about 60, 65% of the people who sought support got that access, that support within four weeks. Now, it'd be interesting to break that down and have a look at each uh, jurisdiction to see whether, in fact, all of the head to help services in Victoria were a real enable at a fast track that care uh, because they were pop up clinics, so to speak. I don't like to use that term, but they were established very quickly to enable fast track access. Um, and whereas in other jurisdictions where they weren't established, maybe it was slower. I actually thought 65% achieving care support and being satisfied with that support within four weeks was actually pretty good. When you think of the workforce implications across our system, and clinicians in and of themselves are also either A, lockdown or B, you know, may have been um, COVID positive. So it's just interesting to note that that issue of support um, was so dominant. I think it correlates, this might get picked up elsewhere, also about gap payments or cost of care. And was that another prohibiting factor to access? Um, and to tease that out, I think would be helpful. So Marcus, they're just some introductory remarks, but, but clearly across Australia, these themes around access have been quite dominant. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, the, 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 st the stats that came out of the survey that we commissioned, and, and this is only really very recently, um, suggested that almost 60% of people were saying that, you know, it was actually, that they were eight, waiting three plus months to yeah. actually get access to, to, to mental health care. So that's probably a little bit divergent to some of the numbers that, that you're talking about, but maybe it's just down to initiatives rather than anything yes. else. Yes, yes. Um, so so it, is, it is interesting that I think the broader access to mental health care may not be as available as perhaps, um, you know, certain se sectors might be seen. Um, I'm, I'm kind of um, interested in whether you feel like there are other ways to, that we can actually, you know, because mental health is obviously very complex. Um, and I guess uh, maybe maybe I'll bring in um, Stephen or Todd, for instance, who might actually have some views because general practice obviously delivers a lot of mental health yes. uh, community. And, um, and you know, do, are we feeling like some of the numbers that Leanne's talking about is actually consistent with, um, you know, with the experience? So, uh, Marcus, I would say yes. Uh, we get a lot of complaints that uh, people just can't see a psychologist or the psychiatrist isn't uh, taking any new bookings. Uh, there are a lot of gaps where if you're in the right field, you can get a specialist, but uh, uh, on the whole, there's a shortage of uh, you know, healthcare professionals who can attend to those with mental health issues. And Todd, what, what do you see in general practice? Are they, are they saying the same sort of things? Yeah, I think, Marcus, it's a really interesting time. So um, coming into the pandemic, uh, Medicare had a, uh, a fairly obvious targeting of people that, that um, build you know, a mental health item number and a non-mental health item number, an attendance item number. Um, and, and they withdrew that because it heavily targeted women practitioners and female patients. But the reality is that we know that around about two thirds of people with mental health have other health issues. And so those two things often go together and Medicare has made a stand against you assessing both things together and being paid together. So I reckon that has probably scared people away from doing as much mental health as needed in general practice, notwithstanding that there still is the bulk of the mental health work done in general practice. And the capacity there has been constrained. Again, there was a, a policy decision in 2018 to restrict the number of GPs migrating to Australia on the basis of saving money. And uh, that, that then fed into the pandemic and, and we've just had a, an extreme shortage of uh, GPs, you know, doctors retiring early on the basis of the challenges that they've seen in the sector and said, I, I don't want to be part of this. Uh, people working less less hours than normal is, is 
uh, what we're seeing across uh, the, the GP network. Uh, and the work is just harder. You know, there's always a little bit of extra conversation tacked on about vaccines, um, you know, all of the other things that go with COVID. So uh, it, it's a difficult world to deliver healthcare within, and the system is not supporting that. that that's a challenge. Yeah. Um, so, so Leanne, just um, going back to, you know, to our discussion, I guess the, the fact that the PHNs or the primary health networks primarily are interested in, in community-based and primary care, but obviously the, there is a interface with hospitals and, and we know that the, you know, hospital, avoidable hospital initiatives, as you were saying, is, is something that's very much um, part of the KPIs, if you like, of what PHNs are meant to be looking at. Um, do, do you feel that the funding of local mental health programs is actually helping to try and reduce some of that hospital admission because you know you, you, we are hearing a lot of hospitals actually under a lot of pressure and mental health is one of those big areas where not being able to get people out of beds in the hospitals or not um, being able to get them into community treatment programs to uh, to manage patients you know that that the 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 the, the types of community based programs are not actually necessarily providing the longer term care that um, that they need. I think that's a really good point, Marcus. I mean, I think. Um... Obviously, when people are acutely unwell and they attend a hospital, you know, they need a level of care that would be outside a remit of a community, a, a, a GP or indeed a community-based service. But increasingly, um, and it goes to the point made, uh, people with a mental health concern often have other co-occurring co factors. And it's often not just as simple uh, as the mental health concern. But the picture you describe is, is absolutely correct. Uh, you know, we see in services even that we commission, for example, um, particularly the Headspace and Youth Services, where they have wait lists, and that's a reflection of people who are who are acutely unwell also not being able to enter, uh, you know, the secondary tertiary system, and uh, you know, it's building back up in the community. I don't think we should underestimate though the workforce uh, implications in this. And um, what we see particularly, you know, in the community sector is, and particularly in the practice of psychology, we've got a, on one hand robust um, a, a small business in psychology across Australia. What we don't have, I don't think, is the same uh, level of input into um, of growth of the psychology, clinical psychology in the not-for-profit sector. And that's a dilemma. How do you get a balance in that for those people who can't afford a gap who require longer term care over time, and it might be small amounts, but over long periods um, of care, you know, how do we get that balance right? Um, there's, that is a structural issue as much as anything. We, you know, and I think of us in WA, you know, our risk areas are in these remote and outer regional areas where the workforce you require to support people where there's high risk, you know, is challenging. And it goes to the GP commentary made as well. But yes, the system from, I think, all fronts is constrained. Couple that with also ageing and dementia care that might have a mental health underlying you know, condition. You know, it is, it is a tricky environment. There is no doubt. I wonder whether what we've got to start to really think about here too is how we equip people to also self-manage. And I don't mean that to take away from needing care but there are, there's really good research about what you need to do to look after yourself, which is you know, not only having informal contact with friends and family, but there are other things. And I think we've got to start to really strengthen some of that to help people also uh, manage. But anyway, I won't go on. But yes, wait list is a dominant factor and acuity you know, and, and blockages in the system is another dominant factor. The more we talk about mental health, which is really important, reducing stigma, help seeking behaviours, the greater the demand we're seeing. Good thing, but the system may not be able to really manage for that as well as we'd like. And, and, and do you think that funding is a, a big part of the solution or do you feel that it's, you know, you've talked about workforce and other things. I mean, that's, that's often difficult to solve immediately, but sometimes funding is something that can be provided given that people are working through budgets and other things now. Like, do you feel that, do you feel that that's actually something that can help solve this problem or is it actually much more impactful than that? I think, well, I might be the lone voice that's, that says it's actually not all about funding. It's actually about the service mix, the system and how it operates, the fragmentation in the system. I actually don't think it's about more money per se. It's about re-engineering the system 
to adapt to what is our current context. So yes, more money is always good, but some of the systemic issues will not be addressed by more money. It's about how we realign services and reshape them uh, uh, moving forward. So uh, yes, I don't think I don't think money's the whole answer. Right, but yeah. conversely, um, if you think of the um, uh, the vested interests, my words, uh, for want of a better term, of keeping some things as they are, you know, it's really hard. Change management in mental health as a system is very challenging. Yet we have great research, we have, you know, good evidence base, we have good planning tools, but but still in all, how do you lead and drive that development of system change is, is challenging. And I think partially, you know, the Commonwealth with the state bilaterals now is is but one vehicle to try and let's join up this system and reduce the fragmentation because fragmentation is evident and that again leads to wait lists and so forth. So that's a real building block, but it's going to require goodwill, um, you know, and collaboration to think about the person and their journey through the system and communities as much as, you know, keeping some things the same. So I might be a polemic in saying it's not about money, um, it's it's I think it's getting really good leadership in the change management we need um, for the betterment of the community at large. Yeah, no, that that it does that does make sense. I, I guess you did reference the fact that the sec the mental health sector is quite fragmented, and whether it's with funding or structurally, you've got um, the you know the public sector, you've also got the not for profit sector, and you've also got the private sector. Um, is is there a role for insurers to come in to, to sort of you know carry some load on uh, on providing better affordability for more private services rather than trying to rely on everybody delivering it through public um, services? Mm -hmm. Or do you feel that? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And and private health insurers have insights that we wouldn't necessarily know of around um, what people are services they are receiving where they are and at what costs uh, because I think those insights can help shape you know developments in the system so you know if you think of um, the you know the mental health reports about demand and supply etc it might be missing some of that I think very important uh, information about mental health supply that is underway and how do you capture that differently and yes, it's not all about the public system, I don't think. I think there's some real work to be done there. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Leanne. That's, uh, that, that's a great start and intro. So uh, mental health, uh, it's a place to watch, uh, obviously, in terms of uh, some of the things that we need to do to make it better. Um, but changing gears a little bit, and, and we've kind of referenced this a little bit, Todd, I want to bring you in. You're, you're a GP influencer, I, I call you. You're, uh, you're quite prolific on social media. Um, but uh, you've run many practices before, and, and now you're actually... Uh, through Scale My Clinic, coaching GPs to grow practices that are more sustainable and, and are able to thrive, particularly in the current environment. Um, to, you know, you, you've referenced this just now. You, you've said that the GP sector's had a pretty tough time um, over COVID and, and, and uh, you know, by and large, I think admirably actually handled um, what's been thrown at them, you know, with staff shortages and Medicare rebates not keeping pace with the cost of running practices. Um, many GPs are now abandoning bulk billing and introducing out-of-pocket fees. Um, you know, should GPs be concerned with the survey results indicating that despite patients overwhelmingly rating their GPs um, highly, um, that almost half would move to a bulk billing GP if there was any out-of-pocket charges? What, what, do you, what, do you, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Uh, and and I, I, did, I did read that with great interest because I, I thought, well, um, it's a little bit like uh, the, the stuff that I think, um, you know, allegedly Ford talked about and see if I did a survey, people would have just asked for a faster horse, you know, when he talked about uh, creating the car. And I think this is kind of one of those obvious things. If you say to people, would you be happy to pay more for a service you currently don't pay for? You know, the self insured answer is I, I probably wouldn't. Um, and I think for GPs, the message is, you know, you should never really have a price proposition without a value proposition adjacent to it. And uh, we all know there is huge value in continuity of care with your primary care network, be that your GP, your pharmacist, your psychologist, you know, having continued exposure to one person who knows you is a, a really, really valuable way of getting the most from anything you invest in healthcare. 
Um, the reality is that over a decade, the, the, the buildup of cost pressures just accelerating in the past year just mean that there's nowhere for people to go other than to start charging. Uh, and I think, you know, GPs are, a lot of GPs were raised in a time of universal health care. So the biggest issue for them is often a personal issue of kind of not necessarily abandoning, but slowly um, relieving themselves of the burden, the obligation to provide universal health care, because uh, effectively the system no longer funds that. And uh, the conversations we're having as well, you know, that's kind of not your job. Your job is to be around in the future and make sure that you are present to deliver health care, not just now, but in the next decade. And no leadership at federal uh, level has has said that that's a priority for them. So uh, we've brought it back to the individual practice owners and said, well, you've just got to do what's right for you to make sure that you can function well and not just sustainable. You know, that implies that you kind of survive, but we just got to get out of survival mindset. These businesses need to do well because it's only when you do well that you can put money into training, to improvement, to innovation. You know, if you're just getting by the skin of your teeth, you're not going to be able to change anything about the way you deliver your service. So I think it's a reality that is accepted by a lot more practice owners. And my tip is we'll see an accelerated uh, take up of private billing in the next 12 months. Uh, and, and I think that's probably a good thing for healthcare. Uh, it does mean somebody's going to have to step in and do the social work that has been done by uh, GPs. And in some cases, pharmacy will do some of that, I'm sure. Great. Well, that's a that's a good intro. I mean, um, and an insight. Um, Stephen, Leanne, Suzanne, you want to kick in? Like any any comments about any of this? Um, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, pa patients are um, despite the fact that uh, Todd's saying that uh, you know nobody wants to pay more when they don't when they aren't paying more now, um, are you still concerned though about uh, about how this might impact um, patients in, in in general? Well, Marcus, we are uh, the APA and the Pharmacy Guild have uh, just run a campaign on affordable medicines now, and that's because we identified from uh, the Australian Healthcare Index report that. Uh, a lot of people couldn't afford their prescription medication. And that was a great concern. And, and the Guild was at the forefront because uh, their clients went in with uh, prescriptions and they couldn't afford them. And very embarrassing. Uh, fortunately, uh, a lot of pharmacists made accommodation for patients that, that couldn't afford their medication, but they're not expected to provide uh, free credit and free medicines for the public. But it's a major issue, so we uh, campaign to reduce the out-of-pocket costs, uh, the, the co-payment, co and we're successful there. And as you know, it's been reduced from $42.50 down to $30. We'd like it reduced even further. But I personally spoke to a number of people with chronic illnesses, uh, multiple prescriptions, often with families, and the whole family ha had issues, and they just could not. Uh, afford their prescription and talking to these people with cost of living pressures we know wages aren't going up inflation's uh, at uh, you know an all-time high over the last decade and expected to go higher food prices are high petrol price are high gas prices energy prices so uh, people are really struggling so a lot of people are saying to us my local GP is bulk bill for 10 years, 20 years, and now they want to charge me. I can't afford to go. What do I do? Put food on the table or go to the doctor? So this is a big issue, and it couldn't have come at a worse time. If the economy was in better shape and we didn't have cost of living pressures, uh, it would be easier on, on those on lower socioeconomic in incomes. But at present, it's come at a dreadful time and a lot can't afford their medications, and it's either that food, food on the table. So really, the demise of bulk billing is really a great concern to us. Leanne, did you have any Yes, I, look, I just think this is such an important topic because what we know is that people who can't afford um, either their prescriptions or indeed seeing their GP, they they have in the past and currently are the people who will attend an emergency department. 
And, and while, you know, GP type presentations in WA, at least in uh, emergency departments are pretty much plateaued, it's people um, uh, in the sort of more complex, uh, and it might be a chronic disease exacerbation that are attending hospital, either via ambulance or indeed walking in, but those category three type complex presentations. And I, you know, my question is, is that, a, is that going to increase even further? as a symptom of people not being able to afford either a primary care or indeed um, allied health or other things that wrap around them uh, and their prescriptions. I think that's what, that's the sort of piece I think we need to watch because one would assume building on Stephen's points that more people will go to the hospital. And as we know, we see the issues daily around hospital you know, ambulance ramping and ED demand. So. I think that might be a, uh, and so it's going to be a, a period, I think, to see whether, in fact, that implication plays out. Uh, Marcus, yeah, Marcus, if I could comment there, I just really wanted to um, support Stephen in uh, mentioning the work that we did with the Affordable Medicines Now campaign. You know, cost of living really was the number one issue that uh, everyone went into the, elect the last federal election with. And it's uh, it really is an extreme concern, you know, across the pharmacies. Uh, you know, Stephen shared with me in listening to numerous sort of patient accounts of of people who, who you know, were really choosing between do we do we pay school fees or get medicines? Do we put food on the table or, or pay for, you know, important healthcare needs? So it, it really is a challenge. I'm not at all advocating that the doctors should have to be uh, out of, uh, you know, financially put in peril because of uh, us all saying it's a shame that we're moving away from bulk billing. I thought an interesting thing in the report was actually the state by state rating breakdown uh, I live in Canberra and the ACT, I think, was the second lowest. I think we were we were pipped slightly by uh, by Tasmania. And I think a big part of that is that it's extremely hard to find any doctor here who will bulk bill because it is a very expensive town for providing any services in. So it's a real challenge. But I wanted to um, support something that Leanne was saying before. You know, she's really sort of saying it's not just about the dollars, it is about the you know what are the the systems the infrastructure the process the network all that like how can we leverage everything to best advantage and before when she was touching on the mental health issues you know it it uh, really occurs to me because obviously all I can do is speak from the pharmacy perspective but it, it occurs to me that you know on average uh, Australians visit a community pharmacy 18 times a year and so that means they're an incredibly prevalent touch point in the lives of people, and especially people who may uh, be living in isolated circumstances, which may be even exacerbating their mental health. But they, they do have a sort of, uh, many of us have a consistent touch point in going to the pharmacy. And uh, so obviously I'm not advocating that pharmacists uh, need to become mental health uh, experts and psychologists. But they are a really integral primary healthcare touch point for patients that are happening regularly through a year and therefore are ideally placed to maybe notice uh, a change in, uh, in their patients or, or to notice a time when people are struggling and to maybe therefore help uh, triage or refer them to the uh, appropriate services and that sort of thing. So I think there's... Um, there, there really is an opportunity um, uh, for the whole sector to work together. So I, I really applaud uh, Health Engine and the Australian Patients Association getting us together today because it really is important to have those um, conversations right across the, the healthcare sector. So thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. And, and I'll come back to what you were just saying about um, the touch points that pharmacy has in the community in a second. Um, I, I also do want to address something that you did say and, and maybe give Todd an opportunity to respond because um, you were saying that, you know, in Canberra, it's actually hard to find a bulk billing GP. And, and I think that it's probably a, a misunderstanding of the Medicare system that, you know, or pay maybe the fact that it's such a blunt instrument that basically a standard consult is paid the same no matter where you are and not recognising what it actually costs to deliver that service. So the fact that as an insurance scheme, Medicare is actually not paying sufficiently to cover the costs of care necessarily depending on where it is um, you know 
is, is probably the failing of an insurance system that probably, if you were calling it a private health insurance premium that you're paying, you're not getting a great deal of value back as a patient because it's a patient rebate. That's actually the, uh, the, the, you know, what Medicare is and bulk billing has traditionally been the thing that says, oh, look, you know, maybe that's what um, uh, will be enough to cover the doctor's costs. Well, clearly the sustainability of general practice is now finding that the, 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 the Medicare rebate isn't enough to actually cover those costs anymore. And if you want to have a sustainable GP sector, um, you know, people will need to pay in the, in the areas where it, it makes, you know, it, it, it makes no economic sense to actually um, um, bulk bill. Um, Todd, did you sort of, you know, want to talk a little bit about some of the supply and demand dynamics you're actually seeing in GP? Because obviously there's a shortage of GPs at the moment um, out of the pandemic and other things. Um, do you have any sense of whether this is just going to be something that patients are just going to have to lobby the government to actually, you know, increase the patient rebate, or is that something else? Is there something else going on that you feel like needs to happen? Yeah, I think um, it's a it's a deeper question than just rebates, really. You know, there, there's some health system design uh, issues that need to be attended to. So the last meaningful change that was attempted was the healthcare homes uh, pilot, which was which was pretty woeful in terms of interest and participation. But there are probably some good ideas in there. You know, I think one of the challenges for us is that. Um, Australia has a healthcare system that has really high standing globally. You know, we, we spend around about 10% of our GDP on our healthcare system. We are a relatively long lived nation. Uh, our expectations are that we can get pretty well all of the care that we need. Um, you know, there are some obvious canaries in the coal mine, like high growth down in metro areas and uh, rural areas where problems show up there first. And our, our, as you rightly said, Marcus, you know, the re rebate, the remuneration for patients is the same irrespective of where you go. And clearly um, the cost of delivering care is different in all of those. I think we just need to be brave in experiencing a little bit. But my biggest concern is we tend to go for really crap ideas that have failed internationally, particularly the UK. We are infatuated with the UK. And yet if you go and look for where are the most doctors escaping from and healthcare workers, you know, the fourth aim of healthcare is, you know, do not do not burn out and screw the workers. The UK failed massively at this. And, uh, and we seem to be wanting to import ideas that have failed in the last decade internationally. I would really like us to, to become a little bit more experimental and brave and more rapidly trying different funding models in locations that it's appropriate just to try and find out what's right. Because if we think there's one solution that's going to work Australia-wide, we will just be we will be massively disappointed again and again and again. Uh, but what we're doing now, I think it's really important to say the output we have now is exactly what we deserve for the input and the system as it is designed. We all agree we don't like it, so we have to change something. What it is, I'm not sure, but we really should experiment and do multiple experiments at the same time, rather than having a cycle time of a decade for crappy experiments and then say that didn't work. You're like, how much time we got to try and solve this problem? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. And, and Leah, no doubt as, uh, as a member of the primary health networks, primary health networks are there and designed to try to localize some of the local need and some of the issues and, and commission for services that are gaps that, uh, ident that are identified by those local communities. So. I think, you know, there are, it's seeming like little green shoots of things that might be able to help. We are having some of these conversations and, and uh, Suzanne, again, thank you for uh, for, for, for mentioning that, uh, you know, this, these are important conversations. So I will bring it back to you, Suzanne, just, just to touch on what you were saying. I mean, obviously, you know, the nature of community pharmacy, as you sort of mentioned, it has been much more consumer oriented just because it is a retail offering. You know, the fact 18, um, on average, 18 times a year, people are going to, to a pharmacy. Um, it, it, it was interesting to see that almost 70% of survey respondents saying that they would be comfortable or would be open to pharmacists with additional training, diagnosing select conditions, and then prescribing the required medications. Um, you know, there is a sense that community pharmacy can and should do more to improve access to health services um, that traditionally have been the role of GPs. You know, what, what do you think is the scope of what you feel community pharmacy can safely deliver? Oh, thank you very much, Marcus. And uh, look, because we've formally turned to me, um, I'm something I'm pretty proud about at the Pharmacy Guild here is that we have had our uh, Reflect Reconciliation Action Plan approved by Reconciliation Australia. So I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm coming to everyone today from Ngunnawal country and uh, pay my respects to our elders past, present and emerging here. Um, look, you've touched on a very interesting point with the reference uh, to the retail nature of the offerings, and it's probably more correct to talk about the retail nature of the locations, 
sort of medicines are obviously are such a normal items of commerce and, and they shouldn't be discretionary purchases, although I, I suppose what we're identifying today is that some people have had some challenges there. Um, because as we're seeing in the report, you know, the report has identified that people are choosing between their medicines and other essentials when it comes to managing the household budget. But look, whilst the location of a pharmacy is often in retail settings, which makes, uh, th this is actually a real bonus because it makes pharmacy a really highly accessible primary healthcare site. You know, the main game is that community pharmacists are, are amongst the most trusted professionals in society. They're highly trained cl clinicians, they're experts in medicine and medication management. And uh, in the capital cities, you know, 96% of us live within two and a half kilometres of a pharmacy. And right across all rural, regional, remote Australia, uh, it's 66% of people are within two and a half kilometres of a pharmacy. So, you know, we do have um, uh, accessibility, I suppose, born out of those kind of uh, retail locations. So obviously um, it's more about them having that professional responsibility for the quality use of medicines so that medicines are used safely, efficiently, efficiently and judiciously. Um, but look, you do touch on an interesting thing there when you raise the issue of, of scope or the scope of practice um, uh, for a pharmacist. And, and uh, this is something that, you know, many people question me about when I meet them uh, sort of socially at the backyard barbecues and things, because it is something that there's becoming some um, increasing conversation going on about. So when we talk about scope of practice, it, it really is about what, what are the... Um, uh, you know, the professional activities that a pharmacist is educated to do, competent to do, authorised to perform and for which they're accountable. And uh, so we really, um, uh, I, I, I suppose, are trying to turn attention at the moment to the fact that the scope of practice of pharmacists is actually uh, restricted uh, by various state and territory legislation. So the scope of practice that they're trained to do in, in uh, universities this big, and then it varies between each state and territory how much of that they're allowed to do. So we don't so much argue for uh, extending the scope of practice as just allowing pharmacists to work to their full scope of practice. So, um, you know, so more and more we're really seeing models of pharmacy that are turning uh, much more towards that health service focus, uh, whether it's new things like, you know, wound, wound care or mums and bubs clinics or men's health clinics and things opening in that space. But, um, you know, you mentioned uh, about the sort of the separation of, of, of roles and, and we tend to talk in terms of uh, prescribe, dispense, administer and review. So we talk about we need uh, pharmacists to have the competency, so they need to have the knowledge and the skills, and they need to have the account accountability and the authority to be prescribing, dispensing, administering and reviewing. So in no way, shape or form is this saying pharmacists want to be uh, GPs. GPs are absolute specialists in their field and, and that's not what we're talking about here. What we are talking about is those opportunities uh, that at the moment uh, pharmacists train for, but are outside of their scope. So uh, maybe matters such as um, therapeutic substitution, where, where maybe uh, an equivalent medicine uh, could be uh, substituted by a pharmacist at times that it's necessary because uh, perhaps there's uh, medication shortages such that there's a, a continuity of appropriate clinical care needed for the patients. And so in those appropriate situations, the pharmacist who is a medication expert uh, is able to uh, therapeutically substitute one medicine for another, obviously within correct clinical protocols and, and, and all that. I'm not talking about uh, being cavalier about this, but there are opportunities like that. Things like the ability to de-prescribe medicines at times and particularly uh, when a patient presents and they're on uh, various medicines that maybe they've presented to different doctors having uh, prescribed for them and it might be the pharmacist who needs to say look we're looking at the the, the interaction of the medicines here you do need to um, consult back with your, your GP that's prescribed this last one. It's not going to be very compatible with others that you're on or what have you. Certainly things like my health record will rapidly improve uh, that knowledge across all of the health uh, professionals. 
Uh, look, you asked for opportunities, Marcus. There's probably opportunities in things like disease management, preventative health, uh, screening in that space. Uh, uh, even obviously, as we've seen, the vaccine preventable uh, conditions. Uh, you know, pharmacy uh, had delivered uh, millions of flu vaccines before COVID came along. And, uh, and yet the government's initial uh, COVID vaccine rollout plan uh, didn't include pharmacy. It's like you've got a you know, range of trained health professionals uh, right across the country and, uh, and yet they uh, were not utilised in that. So, which is kind of back to Leanne's point that we need to use what we've got better. Uh, so now, obviously, uh, we're, we're uh, millions upon millions now of COVID vaccines have been delivered in pharmacy, which is great. But there are travel medicines, there's other injectables, maybe pharmacy is an appropriate location for that. But again, uh, state and territory legislation dictates uh, uh, which uh, particular uh, vaccines or, 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 or injectables can be uh, administered uh, in pharmacies, and it differs very much by state and territory, which is a bit frustrating too. You know, there's probably opportunity with things like uh, the ordering and, and interpreting of, of test results, pathology tests, so working with uh, patients a bit closer there. Certainly point of care testing, diagnostic testing, that was something that's come up a bit in discussions around, uh, you know, the number of people that might have bought their rapid antigen test, but then really didn't feel um, competent to, to use it. So, you know, what was the opportunity for pharmacy to maybe be doing uh, point of care testing for, for COVID and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. That's, a, that's obviously a very comprehensive answer. I, I um, would like to maybe throw it over to the panellists to maybe respond and uh, maybe, um, Todd, did you have anything? Um, I, I don't know whether this is an incendiary question, but like, uh, do you have any comments about uh, how you think this might encroach on some of the GP stuff? Despite uh, what uh, I think, um, thanks for the opportunity to, to uh, to chat about it, I, I think there's no doubt that um, you know having having a really good team-based care with with pharmacy and and GPs is beneficial for everybody. Um, you know the, there are um, no doubt as many GPs as there are pharmacists that have been saved by the the two, the two working uh, in close unison, and you know um, there's absolutely no doubt about that. I think in terms of relative size, you know there are around about five thousand eight hundred community pharmacies. There are about 6,800 accredited general practices Australia-wide. So I think the relative size conversation often sounds like there are more pharmacies. Uh, in fact, there are more general practices uh, Australia-wide. And you're shaking your head. I'd love to. I'd love to hear a bit more about that in a sec, Suzanne. Um, no, no, I'm. I'm uh, yeah, I'm agreeing with you that no, I wasn't representing. Okay, right. There are more pharmacies. No, I wasn't it, for me representing the, that. Um, like we do know, obviously, that there are a number of towns across Australia that don't have a GP but do have a pharmacist, and that's the perfect opportunity for telehealth and and other services like that working in conjunction. So I'm 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 supporting you, Todd. The multidisciplinary. Yeah, uh, and the, and the challenge I think is that um, you know when, when we talk about. Uh, you know, selective clinical diagnoses, it would be really nice if patients actually presented with a selective clinical diagnosis. In fact, what they present with is symptoms. And, uh, you know, the challenge is that they can be anything. And, and one of the, one of the um, problems in medicine is that, uh, you know, there's, there's that saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so, um, you know, the UTI, uh, you know, prescribing example is, is a fairly good one. I mean, a presenting symptom that sounds like a UTI can be a, an absolute, um, it can be a huge breadth of, of um, causes underlying that. And so, you know, whilst you might have a bell curve that says, yes, majority of these will be a real UTI, there are some outliers uh, that, uh, that, you know, the question is, what are the trade-offs we make? Um, and I think that's true of any constrained budget. You know, we've got a health budget that needs to stretch further. It would be silly for us to assume there are not operational trade-offs with changing the way that we're currently doing things. And I'm not suggesting we don't need to change things, but there are always trade-offs. And in that, in that um, you know, prescribed dispense administer review, um, there had always been a separation of, of kind of roles in that. And that spectrum, we're now proposing that that spectrum can adequately be looked after by by one person or one profession. Uh, again, I think the question is, what do we trade off there? And if it goes, if, if it's pharmacy, what, why would it not be um, that you can get all of those things from one visit in a GP as well? Um, I, I would just consider that if, that if that's true, that that can be reasonably done by one profession, then what, why is there not symmetry with that? Uh, that would be the main questions that I'd ask with that. 
Yeah, I don't think symmetry so much the question is actually availability of service to patients. Like, you know, I yes, it is $80 out of pocket for me to go to a GP in Canberra, but I also can't get an appointment with a GP within about three days. So something like the UTI trial that you mentioned, you're in a bad way if you haven't got into the doctor within three days. So we're not talking about, you know, the ability to prescribe everything a doctor could prescribe. That is not what we're talking about. Um, it really is looking at what are those opportunities where there can be greater working together to make sure there's some pressure drawn off the GPs even so that, you know, they're doing the quality of work that they want to be doing and, uh, and, and proper care is being administered. And look, Todd mentioned a very interesting point there because you, you're really drawing on, um, you know, when we talk about the separation of, of, um, of, of prescribing and dispensing, you know, that really is obviously a safety and a quality use of medicines issue. But more so what he's touching on there is conflict of interest. And, uh, and, and I suppose, you know, that is something that every, uh, every uh, professional, um, you know, has to manage. All health practitioners practice under their respective code of ethics. And, uh, and I think that that, uh, you know, shouldn't be dismissed. You know, we already see uh, GPs um, being able to diagnose and recommend a treatment, which they then administer, and then they can charge a consult fee for. We see dentists assessing and then recommending, then undertaking dental work. We see that with, with surgeons all the time. Um, I think we do, um, you know, have some great rigour in place with things like the Code of Ethics. Uh, and it is about making sure we've got the correct competency standards in place. So, so I'm not talking about flicking a switch on anything with pharmacists. It's more about, uh, you know, what are they trained to do? Are the appropriate competency standards in place? You know, what are they accountable for? And then what are the clinical protocols that are being followed? And yeah, so it's not about, it's not a, it's not a turf war um, at all. It's really about how do we get improved uh, health and wellness outcomes for all Australians. And at the moment, uh, I think our um, report shows that they're missing out. So um, yeah, as Todd said earlier, we need to think outside uh, the box really of what how we've done things in the past and shake things up, not make the UK mistakes, as he said. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Suzanne. And uh, it wouldn't be healthcare with the fragmentation without a turf, good old fashioned turf war. I mean, that's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Marcus, from a, a patient's perspective, while there's a shortage of uh, GPs and long waiting times to see a GP, just makes sense to utilise uh, pharmacists where they're suitably qualified and they've got that skill set just to ease the pressure and, and provide adequate uh, care and advice to, to patients. I, I think um, I think I think the word paid off was being used um, quite uh, quite a lot there, and 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 I, and, and I think th that that's actually a very apt word, largely because I think you know accessibility is one thing, um, affordability is another, but um, quality and the you know and, and actually it's it's the and Todd kind of touched on this as well is that you don't necessarily want to put colleagues in in a place where they are sometimes actually um, at risk of uh, of creating adverse outcomes as well. Not necessarily because of bad training or, or, or any malicious behaviour or even conflicts of interest, but I think ultimately as a system we need to look after patients' interests. Um, but um, you know, it's 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 it is you know for for wants of sometimes convenience or uh, access, you may actually um, you know be making certain choices that uh, would put patients in uh, at risk. And and I think that's the main thing. You know, we work as a team um, by and large in the healthcare system, um, but uh, you know, without sort of formal lines of understanding what our roles are, it can sometimes be very blurry and then the patient gets stuck in some of those cracks. So I think that's, uh, that's fair. So Stephen, I think that's a good time to call you in. I think, you know, we're clearly hearing stories about large ED wait times. Um, there's elective surgery delays that are well past the categories that they're supposed to be um, seen by. Um, you know, the, 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 these are signs that the public hospital system particularly aren't coping with demand. And then you hear about things about pri private health insurance being unaffordable, um, not good value for money. This can only be a concern for even more pressure on public hospitals coming. Like, you know, people are probably going to abandon private health insurance if they don't see it's good value and there's more cost pressures. And now public hospitals are going to take the brunt of it. What, what, do, you, what do you think needs to happen to solve this issue? Well, uh, you've just uh, described a kind of a very challenging uh, environment. 
but long waiting times in emergency departments is demonstrated by uh, you know, the, the survey and growing waiting times for elective surgery are sure signs that the public hospital system is under pressure and not coping. Fortunately, all our respondents complained that private health insurance is unaffordable. People aren't dropping out of private health insurance at the moment, and many private health insurers are offering cash back and premium increase deferrals to their members to retain them. And it's important that the private uh, hospital system plays its part. In relation to public hospitals, our recommendations are that, one, the federal government permanently increases its funding to 50%. Uh, it's said that it will continue it on for another few months. A lot of uh, bodies like the AMA have advocated this for some time, as is the Australian Patients Association. Two, an education campaign be run in relation to when to call an ambulance and when to go to an emergency department as opposed to visiting your local GP in the short term. We've spoken about taking pressures off the healthcare system and, and this is one way of doing it. Bulk billing needs to be maintained to avoid emergency departments being overloaded. So that's uh, another challenge for our new federal government. State governments need to be encouraged to enter into arrangements with private hospitals to utilise their spare capacity and to reduce the backlog uh, for elective surgery in the medium term. Finally, community hubs and daycare surgery be utilised to treat less complicated surgery to reduce the waiting list. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and um, I'll just give maybe the other panellists, particularly you, Leanne, did you have any sort of things to add to that? I mean, you're, you're seeing obviously with your state health colleagues, um, probably some feedback on, on, on how the state of the system is going. Do you, do you feel like, uh, you know, you've got anything to add to this conversation? Well, you know, I agree that, um, you know, we've, that public hospitals are, you know, really feeling pressure. But I'm also concerned about sustainability of primary care and, and in particular general practice. Uh, and we're seeing decreasing numbers of trainees, registrars wanting to become GPs. And I think that is, you know, if we see that as the sort of cornerstone to the rest of the system, we've really got to focus on the systemic issues sitting in and around general practice. Uh, you know, I go to the commentary about different funding models and particularly in country and regional locations where um, an EMBS system is just is unsustainable for a practice to operate. Um, so, you know, while I agree uh, with much that Stephen said uh, from my perspective, if we don't start to really focus on um, primary care and general practice, notwithstanding, you know, the other topics of pharmacy and dentistry, et cetera, I think we're all in trouble. So, you know, it's a bit like how can we balance out the emphasis that's required to have a sustainable public health system and reduce waiting, but at the same time, we've, you know, primary care has been at the back end of the bus for quite some time, and I think we really need to uh, put some emphasis in on uh, that system. Thanks, Leon. Any any other further questions or comments from Todd or Suzanne at this point? Suzanne, I won't jump in first. Oh, you know, look, I probably didn't really have anything significant other than just to support Leanne there. Um, primary healthcare, though, is um, more than just GP practices. So, so uh, you know, it really is, you know, how do we bring all those together? And obviously, that's a critical role for the, the PHNs there. And uh, but look, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have had over two years of of uh, dealing with COVID and we, you know, we therefore, uh, you know, are in that enviable position that we've seen how much the healthcare workers in this country have gone above and beyond. And so, you know, I'm sure I speak for everyone on the call, Marcus, really what I say, you know, I couldn't be 
prouder of what I've seen from the healthcare professionals right across the country. I'm I'm not a pharmacist by profession. Dare I say I'm actually a lawyer by profession. Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why, you know, I can easily have the greatest of respect for seeing what uh, has, has happened. So, um, so, yeah, really just wanted to thank everyone else on the call and thank everyone listening because it's, uh, uh, we've really uh, achieved a lot uh, in the last few years. Thanks, yeah. Suzanne. I was going to say, I think um, Suzanne's point is, is extremely valid. You know, primary care is broader than general practice, but Barbara Starfield's work is really clear that if you don't have a foundation of investment in primary care, you pretty well end up with a system like the American system. If you've got 15% of medical school graduates choosing general practice, the other 85% choosing non-GP specialties. Since 2016, we have 52% of GPs that have their primary qualifications from a country other than Australia. Thank goodness they came here. Without them, we would be absolutely screwed. And they're often great GPs, but it's a really flawed assumption to assume we can continue continue to import a solution to our underinvestment in one sector. Uh, I think Stephen's um, list there is, is awesome. One thing that's important to recognise is that the investment in PHI is the same as the investment in general practice, broadly speaking, in terms of dollars. Uh, and anything that goes up at double CPI, which is about what happens with the PHI index, is meant to represent the underlying costs in healthcare. That, that, that has not been acknowledged in any funding mechanism for uh, primary care, which tends to go at half CPI, some insane difference between those two. So there are really big issues and cost pressures are going to build up when something's going up at double CPI. You're just going to have people bailing from that. So again, I think this comes back to we need a really big rethink on what we're doing. If we keep doing the same of what we're doing now or a little bit different, we can expect to be having the same conversation in a decade, but probably in a situation that is a lot worse. We're leaders Globally, we're amongst the leaders, if not the leaders. We need to be innovating and creating our own solutions, and we need to be experimenting because you can't just get it right in theory without testing it in the real world. I'd love to see us doing more of that and putting patients at the center. It just has to be what's right for patients. Thanks, Todd. Um, couldn't summarize it better myself, to be, uh, to be honest. Um, I, I'm uh, conscious of time, and, and we are coming to time. So. Uh, we do have one question, uh, and thank you, um, uh, um, Ilan, um, uh, for, for offering up this question. It was just, they've asked, to what extent did the report and recommendations address the social and environmental drivers of health, e.g. unaffordable housing, domestic violence, climate change impacts, and so on? Um, I, I think that's a, a fantastic question. The report itself, it probably fell outside the scope somewhat of uh, asking that, no doubt. Um, you know, I mean, I think everybody believes that there's significant impacts, social impacts, uh, social determinants of health is a big part of um, how, you know, holistically a patient um, is. They're not just their, 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 uh, their bodies and their health and, 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 and so on. It's, there's a whole context that surrounds patients and consumers. Um, I, I think um, perhaps uh, someone like Leanne, who's uh, obviously dealt with a lot of these uh, other um, extraneous factors, is not just around healthcare, um, might want to comment on this. Um, but uh, certainly the report itself didn't actually uncover that as part of its scope, but, um, you know, no doubt uh, all these things are important. Uh, Leon, did you want to say anything about this? Oh, only that there, those uh, determinants are incredibly important and, you know, evidence is very clear about the correlation between the social determinants and people's health status. Hence, um, from a PHM perspective, perspective, trying to focus on that health equity piece uh, because you know, for a whole range of reasons, which I won't go on, but the, there's a great connectivity. Yeah, and I think, look, obviously the, the world is going to go into a pretty um, interesting place in the next 18 to 24 months. I think economically, uh, there are going to be some, some serious decisions that are going to be made by global leaders uh, on lots of different things that everybody cares about, including the environment uh, and, and where we spend our, 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 our much um, uh, our scarce dollars, I think. Um, so, so this is a, a space that I think we need to watch very closely. I know there are lots of doctors who are particularly keen on, uh, and health professionals very keen on, on, on uh, things like climate impacts to, to the health of their patients as well. Um, so, so yeah, it, it will be interesting to see. Um, Stephen, I, um, I, I'm, I, I always like to leave it uh, first. Uh, the first was the report, which is the voice of the patient, but also be keen to sort of uh, end with the voice of the patient. I think it's really important. Um, did you have any parting words before uh, we, uh, we call time? Well, thanks, Marcus. I'd just uh, like to thank all the uh, uh, you know, people who uh, completed this survey to have over 11,000 people all around Australia complete the survey enables us to uh, 
present these findings, uh, not only to the public, but all the health authorities. It's gone to the new Minister for Health and all the decision makers. And uh, there's, uh, you know, a lot in this uh, report, a lot of issues. Uh, we didn't cover them all because uh, we spoke about dental care. That's a big issue in Australia. Uh, we often talk about rural care. We didn't touch uh, elective surgery much and the waiting list for elective surgery is blown out. So there's a lot of learnings from uh, this uh, report and uh, I'm glad that we've been able to work so cooperatively with Health Engine to uh, undertake these important surveys. Thanks, David. So, cool. uh, so, so thank you uh, all uh, for, for attending. Uh, thank you to our panellists today um, and, and those who asked questions. Uh, for, for more on the Australian Healthcare Index, um, do visit australianhealthcareindex.com.au to download the report and uh, get access to the interactive dashboard. And uh, on behalf of Health Engine and the Australian Patients Association, I uh, hope to see you again next time. Thank you very much.